This is a resource of Just Loving God. The Lord is with us. Take courage. From Haggai 2, verses 3 to 9. So as I said, the Lord trashed my sermon, and uh, I really like that when that happens, although it's quite alarming sometimes. And what he does is I think he reminds you, you better rely on me, um, because nobody wants to hear from you. They only want to hear from me, and that's what the Lord says, and it's a wonderful thing. So our text today, and I've entitled this sermon, The Lord is with us. Take courage. Text today is Haggai 2, verses 3 to 9. It's about two-thirds of the way through your Bible, if you're not sure where that is. Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet, now be strong, O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not, for thus says the Lord of hosts. Yet once more, in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land, and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in, and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine, the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts, and in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. This is so wonderful. And I was just reading through this and God really just spoke to me. God is with us. He is with us and he is pleased with us. God is saying, keep going, keep working, fear not. You are on the right path. There is a glory here that men fail to see very often. There's a glory also that's coming so much more of my tangible presence. The early rains and the late rains are gonna fall. They're gonna soften and prepare the ground. Do not despise the day of small things. I am pleased with the things that men despise so often, for it's what I am building. And I really feel that's what the Lord is saying to us today. So I want you to be encouraged. So what happened here uh, under Haggai's uh, prophecy time, around 520 BC, the Israelites had come back from exile. God had disciplined them in Babylon, and they just come back. Um, they come back a bit earlier. Zerubbabel had laid the foundation of this temple uh, many years earlier, but then it had got stopped with persecution and opposition, and the people were discouraged. There was just this little slab there, nothing like it had been under Solomon's temple 430 years roughly earlier, uh, that had been destroyed in 586 BC under Nebuchadnezzar. And they just looked at this little slab, and they were so downcast in their hearts. Lord, what is this? Some of us are old enough to remember the good old days when God was here amongst us, when the Shekinah glory cloud of God was there. And they were just demoralized. And God came to encourage them and empower them. You see, he sees things very differently than we do. He is not impressed with human things. They say, well, how could you have destroyed that beautiful temple so richly overlaid with gold? He said, but I don't care about that. I care about different things. You see, he sees the things that we can't yet see. And he says, for this little slab here, there's going to be a much less grand building. Oh, but the glory of that house is going to be greater than Solomon's temple. You see, we can't see. We get distracted with earthy things. And our hearts struggle with that. And he encourages us that he is with us. He has not left. Times may well be hard, but he is here walking through it. And he is saying to us to get up. And he's saying to get to work. Don't pull back because it's hard, because you're feeling demoralized. Go forward, go on. And we will be successful in building because he is building this house. He is building our hearts. He is building the lives of men, women, and children around us. And his glory and his peace are going to fill this place. And I'll tell you, the glory of that place, this place, our hearts, our lives, this ministry will be greater than it has been and the Lord will be glorified. So my purpose is simple. I want you encouraged today. I want you renewed in your sense of calling. If you began to wobble, if you began to question, I want you walking out of here again saying, no, 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 no. I know what God has said to us. I know why God has called me here precisely. 
and I'm going out, and I'm going to do this. So let's double down and work, and let's get our sleeves rolled up. So I want to talk quickly about how God sees things differently than humans do. This is really important. This is something we have to grow in. He views his present work amongst us very differently than human beings do. Human beings look at outward things. Typically, they do not see what God is doing. And we must be a people who have the eyes to see what God is doing and what God is saying. Miss that? You've missed everything. And so Haggai 2.3, it says, is it not as nothing in your eyes? Sometimes you can look at what God is doing and you can almost, dare we say it, despise the little work that he's doing in your life. The little work you think that he's doing amongst us. The little work you think that he's doing in Kelowna. But he says, "Mm, yet work, for I am with you. He says, no, 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 I'm happy. You go ahead, you work. And he's talking here about a glory that's coming. He's prophesying here through Haggai that the Messiah is coming, some 520 years in the future. And he's coming, and he's gonna be the glory. God in flesh, actually present, walking on that slab that looks so little today, so weak and lowly, and yet the king of all glory will walk upon it. Oh, if only you could see. If you could see what he's doing. If you could see what he's preparing in our midst for our hearts to see. Haggai 2.7, I will fill this house with glory. The latter glory, verse 9, of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace. And he's always got greater plans than you know about. And he's always got greater plans than you ask for. And he has greater plans than you can imagine. Remember the end of Ephesians 3? We've been going through that far greater. Trust him. Today, I want you to decide, I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm going to stop looking with natural eyes. I'm going to trust you. People say, well, yeah, I can see what's wrong. I can see there's problems. Solomon's temple was absolutely stunning. But this, I don't know. The absence from this second temple of all the carvings and all the splendor and of the the overlay of gold, it was tons and tons of gold and silver worth billions in today's money. How, Lord, could you just let that be destroyed? And the Ark of the Covenant and the the incense altar, all of it gone and the, 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 the Shekinah glory no longer here in this second temple. And the menorah, the, the seven prong candlestick, solid gold, it's gone, Lord. The light that it shed is gone. The cherubim on the curtains are gone. The Urim and the Thummim by which we did discerned your will, Lord, they're gone. The spirit of prophecy seems to be gone, and yet he sent Haggai. God saw something unimaginably better. The Messiah is coming. And this church would arise that would be the true temple of the living God. Do you understand what you're involved with? Do you understand what he's doing? I hope you'll see by the end. I hope the Lord God, by his grace, opens your heart. See, people judge and they measure and they mock based on outward appearance. That's what humans do. But the outward scale and the beauty, and the impressiveness, all of which please men, are of no interest to God whatsoever. He has no care for those things. It's like when the Lord sent Samuel to appoint David, to anoint David as king. He went through all the brothers first. He came to Eliab in 1 Samuel 16. And the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. People look at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Be strong, therefore. He's saying to you today, work, for I am with you. There is absolutely no comparison, naturally, between what they had and what they now have. And God is not the least bit concerned. And so our job is to trust him and not be concerned either. You don't have what Solomon had? Well, God's got something better. Look what he says here. Maybe you don't have this shiny center of worship that all the world comes to admire. Ah, but God sees something else. You see, he has treasure in ugly clay pots. And although men don't applaud, heaven applauds clay pots full of glory because it's a work of grace. 2 Corinthians 4, 7. He's come to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Do you see what he's working in us? Dependency and humility. Maybe you don't see the same revival that came into Cornelius' house that day, or, or into Antioch, 
Or centuries later into the Kirk of Shots in Scotland in 1630. Maybe you don't see that. Or the, the revivals of Wesley and Whitfield in the 18th century. Or the Second Great Awakening in the 19th century. Or the Welsh Revival in the 20th century. Maybe you don't see yet the Bangladeshi, Iranian and Chinese revivals of the 21st century. But God has called you for this precise time, this precise place, this precise people group for his precise and glorious purpose. And I want you to trust him with that. Maybe you don't have something to impress a queen of Sheba. (laughs) Well, God is doing a work amongst us that impresses him. And I'm happy with that. People assess all the wrong things. They look at their measures. They don't look at God's measure. But in 1 Corinthians 1.28 says that God chose what is low and despised in the world. Even things that are not. To bring to nothing things that are. So that no human being might boast in the presence of God. It's all of grace. And the quicker we can relax into grace, the quicker he will do amongst us what he is intended to do. So be encouraged. God is with us. He's amongst us. The evidence of his favor, the evidence of his grace, the evidence of his power is all over this clay pot of a church. It's all over it, infusing it. It's over... It's in all of your little clay pot of a life, the glory of God. You say, well, I know I'm too young. Well, I know I'm too old. No one will listen to me. Well, the church isn't cool. It's not, it's not big. It's, it's not structured the way everyone says it has to be structured. It's all wrong. Well, he says, be strong. He says, fear not. He says, I am with you. He says, I will fill you with even more glory. That's what he says. Yet now be strong, Haggai 2.4. O Zerubbabel, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land. You see, God's talking to every single one of us in the midst of all of this. And he's pleased with us. And I want you to rest in that. This week, God has so encouraged our hearts. So, so encouraged our hearts. You know, you sometimes begin to wonder, Lord God, this is long. Lord, this is hard. Lord, it's dark and it's cold and there's... There's snow that's driving horizontally into my face. And I wonder, Lord, where are you in the darkness? And he says, I'm with you. Fear not. You know, he sent a pastor 290 kilometers, a senior pastor of a church of over 1,000 people, to spend two solid days with us for no apparent reason. I I said to him, are you sure? He said, I'm coming. I said, but you hardly know us. He said, I know. But I need to come. So he came. I tried to give him a love offering. He said, you already gave me a love offering. He said, you told me about this work of God in Kelowna. He said, it was life-giving to my soul. He hadn't even seen you. He hadn't even met any of you. And then two days later, he sent the director of a major church planting network to us, who's 400 kilometers away. And that was over the phone, so he didn't drive here. But you know what? He spoke into our hearts. He spoke into our lives. He confirmed exactly what we knew in our hearts, but were trembling over. And then on Thursday morning, he caused a man 8,000 kilometers away who owns a television channel, covers the whole of Europe and UK, to put out a prayer request for our little family and this church and to pray that the Lord would heal our children and would Come and convict those who have set themselves to destroy the work of the Lord, whom we pray for. And it just was like a blast of glory straight into the heart. It so encouraged us. It so blessed us. And we suddenly saw the great panorama of God's great church, the church universal. It is is global. And it consists of all saints who ever lived and who now lived and whoever will live and those who are above and those who are here below with us. What a great work the Lord is doing, and we are in the middle of it. All within three days, he confirmed to us again and reminded us again of his calling on our lives and our calling as a people. So be encouraged. And the next thing Haggai says is get to work because God is with us. Work, for I'm with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. So in our waiting for answers to prayer, in our waiting for relief from suffering, 
in our waiting for more people to be impacted by the convicting power of the Holy Spirit, we work, for he's with us. Never ever take your eyes off the prize. Never ever let your ears be shut to the call. Don't let it happen. Keep going. You're called to be part of this work. You specifically are called. You are called to work with the saints that God has brought together. You are blessed. This work is endorsed by God, by the power of his presence, by the miracles he does in our midst, by the strength and the power of his word that convicts of sin and plucks souls from hell. You are called to build with us. So labor, labor for that food that does not perish. And you will see such a harvest. You know, he's made a covenant with us. He made a covenant with you personally. When he brought you out of your Egypt of sin, he made a great blood covenant. He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I've started a work and I will complete it in your life. And that is true for this people. He has made a covenant with his church. And his church will be glorious. And she will be his bride. You know what? Demons come and they sow doubt. They sow fear. And they seduce with evil. Demons come and they question your calling. They come and they question the calling of local churches en masse. The demons send their people to infiltrate churches. They do it all the time. I would do that if I was the devil. It's exactly what I'd do. And I make him look just like wheat. Hmm. But God is with us. The demons come to accuse. Satan comes to bring shame for sins in your life that have been forgiven. He comes to even bring shame for sins you've not even committed. He just says you have. But God is with us, and we can and we must double down to work with confidence and joy in this calling. So be encouraged. And you say, well, okay, so how do we do this work? I thought we weren't meant to do works. We all know better than that now. Hopefully we've taught you better. Of course there are works. They're predestined for you. Ephesians 2.10. Before time began, these good works are yours to do. So let's get down and do them. Well, how do we do them? Okay, well, number one, study the scriptures. It is a, a basic expectation. People say you can't tell people that to me all the time, but I still do it. It's a basic expectation that you will read your Bible a minimum of once a year in this church. A minimum. Some of you just finished it in 90 days. Some of you did it, one of you did it in a month. And it's not a competition. It's so that you get God's word into your soul. You do that enough times, and I tell you, you begin to connect all the dots, and the Holy Spirit teaches you of who God is and his nature. So study the scriptures. This is the first way you build truth into your life. You build the truths of God into your being, into your mind, and your mind begins to renew and to transform. This is building the knowledge of God, and by the power of the Holy Spirit that's in you, working energetically and powerfully, just as it raised Christ, so he's giving you wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God. That's what's happening. Number two, Daily communion with God. Oh, without that, brothers and sisters, you are on your own. I mean, he's with you, but you can't do that. You have to be with God every day. You must. And why? Because he wants to talk to you. He wants you to cement God's truth into your life through communion with him. This isn't just an academic thing. It's a thing of the very depths of the being, the inner man, the soul, and I tell you, come every day and worship with reverence and awe. If you lose the awe, you've lost so much. Never lose the awe. Number three, how else do we build with God? Well, become and remain a community that's in unity. We lose that, I tell you what, we have lost the very meaning of ecclesia, of church. And I tell you what, that's, one of, that's the, probably the main thing the devil will come in to try and destroy. And I tell you, we have to defend it, sometimes fiercely, from those who would tear the sheep apart, who would destroy and sow suspicion. And that's a hard thing to have to do, but it must be done. And I tell you what, God is ferocious in the defense of his sheep. So actively cooperate with the building of the body, the church of Jesus Christ. Number four, how, do we, how else do we work? Well, grab people from the flames of sin and death. Grab them. See souls and grab them. Look differently at people around you. Don't just get irritated with that lady at the checkout. 
See her as God sees her. Don't get defensive and angry at the the atheist who mocks and laughs and spits in your face. See him for what he is, blind, dead, impoverished, full of rebellion against God, because the carnal mind cannot understand the things of God. And such were you. But God had mercy. See them as he does. Grab them. That's all we're told to do, Matthew 28, 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, the same spirit of Christ speaking through Haggai, I'm with you. Of course, Christ said the same thing. Number five, how else do we work? Well, be content. Be grateful for the extraordinary grace that is upon us. The extraordinary grace that's upon your life. Do not take it for granted. Ephesians, sorry, Colossians 3.15. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. To which indeed you were called in one body and be thankful. Hebrews 12.28. Therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. Mm. You know, you can get so used to so much grace. You can get so used to it. You can get so used to so much of God's tangible presence that you begin to take it for granted. And then you cease to build. So be content and be thankful. Number six, suffer well. You know, who ever told you that this... Christian walk would have no pain and suffering and loss and difficulty. Who told you that? That, that, well, that woman on YouTube, why did she say this? That guy who smiles like a grinning wolf and tells you God's just come to make you rich. Oh, he's come to make you rich, all right, but not with a boat. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2, 3, share in suffering as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 10, 32, but recall the former days when after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, (laughs) and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your property since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance. So that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For yet a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay. But my righteous one shall live by faith. And if he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and preserve their souls. He's talking to you. Oh, he's shaking what can be shaken. And you may go through suffering. But I tell you, suffer well. Do not waste your suffering. Come out the other side knowing even more than you did when you went in that God is good and God is great and God will see you through and he has a purpose. Number seven, how else do we work? Well, with confident faith. Knowing that he protects us. You say, yeah, but it feels dangerous, this Christianity thing. Uh, the, 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 The guy on YouTube told me it was safe. He told me it was easy and nice and And if you've got any trouble from anyone, then you're doing something wrong. This feels unsafe, Lord, but I will work and build, just like Nehemiah and all the people who built those walls with confident faith, knowing your protection. We have blessing, we have protection, and we know that he will destroy our enemies in the end. Zechariah 2, verse 3. The angel who talked with me came forward, and another angel came forward to meet him, and he said to him, run, say to that young man, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as villages without walls because of the multitude of people and livestock in it. And I will be to her a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord. And I will be the glory in her midst. Verse 8. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Hmm. Behold, I will shake my hand over them and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion. For behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. And many nations shall join themselves to the Lord in that day and shall be my people. And I will dwell in your midst. And you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Oh, this is the new covenant. 
This is the incoming of the Gentiles joining with believing Jews. Oh, what a glorious thing this is. And we are part of it. And I tell you what, you are, you're the apple of his eye. That means the pupil. That is a very sensitive and heavily guarded part of the anatomy. And that's what God sees you as. To build with such confident faith. There is such blessing on you. There is such a, a glory in your midst. And you don't even need walls. In fact, you will not be able to contain the blessing that he pours out. Oh, I'll tell you what, this is a church with no walls. We've always said it. We had four months outdoors Sunday morning church last year. We're out there on the streets. This is a church with no walls because he, the blessing's too great for walls. He wouldn't wanna, you couldn't fit it in a building and yet we're safe. You see, we don't need natural walls to be safe. No weapon formed against you will prosper. Why? Let me tell you why no weapon that's forged and formed in those flames of hell can prosper against you. Well, because God created the enemy blacksmith. God created the ravager to make the weapons. You say, what? That doesn't fit with my theology. Well, you better read the Bible then. Because I just quoted Isaiah 54, 17. Sorry. You see, this is because God has complete sovereignty over evil. And he's glorious. Isaiah 54, 13. All your children shall be taught by the Lord. And great shall be the peace of your children. In righteousness you shall be established. You shall be far from oppression. You shall not fear and from terror, for it shall not come near you. If anyone stirs up strife, it is not from me. Whoever stirs up strife with you shall fall because of you. Behold, I have created the smith who blows the fire of coals and produces a weapon for its purpose. I have also created the ravager to destroy. No weapon that is fashioned against you shall succeed. And you shall refute every tongue that rises against you in judgment. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the vindication from me declares the Lord. Oh, what mighty and strange words of God. What encouraging words. Even over evil, he is sovereign. And he permits, according to his great wisdom, evil secondary causes to nip and yap at our heels and I suspect it's to cause us to run to him and depend upon him. So still on this subject of having confident faith, this is how we're building this last point. Knowing that he protects us, Zechariah 2.5 goes on, I will be to her a, f- a wall of fire all around, declares the Lord, and I will be her glory in a midst. And I think that's what's happened for us. It feels like there is a wall of fire for this church with no walls. It feels like there's a glory within us that only God could have achieved. You know, it just reminds me of the Garden of Eden when Adam and Eve were thrown out back in Genesis 3.24. It says, he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Oh, God likes fire. He, he likes defending. It reminds me also of Elisha's tremoring servant in 2 Kings 6. And the servant said, and they were surrounded by Syrian armies. He said, alas, my master, what shall we do? And he said, do not be afraid. For those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elisha prayed and said, oh Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man. And he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire. All around Elisha. That's what's around you. Do you not realize? Lord, open their eyes that they might see encamped around the hills of light the armies of the Lord and the flaming fire of his presence. So, how do you work? Well, one, you study scripture. Two, daily commune with God. Three, be a community that's in unity. Four, grab people from the flames of sin and death. Five, be content. Be thankful for extraordinary grace. Number six, suffer well. Number seven, have confident faith, knowing that he protects us. Amen? And then the Lord really challenged me this week through my wife. That always happens. That's why I married her, apart from the trust fund. Um, That's a joke. God knew I couldn't handle a trust fund. 
She said to me, you know, I think the Lord has spoken to me. You've been knocked. You've fallen down on your face. You've been crying out to God. Help us, almighty God. What shall we do? And she said, get up. And I listened when she says that. So I got up. And it reminded me of Joshua. They just lost the attack on AI. They just had a glorious victory at Jericho. Unbelievable. They go and take this teeny weeny pinty wincy little city and they lose. He comes back and he falls on his face. Joshua 7, 6. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, why have you brought this people over the Jordan at all to give us into the hands of the Amorites to destroy us? Would that we had been content to dwell beyond the Jordan. O Lord, what could I say? When Israel has turned their backs before their enemies, for the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it and will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? The Lord said to Joshua, Get up! Why have you fallen on your face? <laughs> I know that's not very Canadian, but that's how I think he said it. He says, I am in your midst. Have you forgotten? Do you not know who brought you over that river? How dare you think of going back over it? What is in your head? Stop fearing. It's totally distracting you from what actually needs to be done. Haggai 2, verses 5 to 7 again. My spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land. And I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in. And I will fill this house with glory. That's what he says in Hebrews 12. He quotes this. Everything is going to be shaken. The Lord is always shaking things. Because there's things he does not want standing. So he shakes them and shakes them and shakes them. And they fall. The Babylonian Empire the Assyrian Empire, the Persian Empire. Then the Greeks came and he felled them like a tree. Then the Romans came, mighty beast with iron fangs, and he felled it like a deadly beast. God is in charge, but we have an unshakable kingdom. Nothing that we have that God's built inside our lives and in our midst can be shaken by anyone or anything. Take courage. All may seem like it's shaking and falling, all of it, but God is working. Well, it seems like it's all going wrong, Lord. But God is in our midst. Have you forgotten? Oh, I, I don't know. Do you even see, Lord? Yes, his watchful eye. He's even watching sparrows, for goodness sakes. Watches you so closely. Mm. Hebrews 12, 28. So let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. For our God is a consuming fire. And you know, nothing can resist his will. Nothing can prosper in its assault against you, against this local body of believers. Nothing. I tell you what, the enemies set themselves with rage. They drive themselves to insanity. In the end, their swords will turn on each other. In the end, their minds will seem to lose rationality as they set themselves against the work of the Lord. And God laughs all the while. Let's join him. Because you're the apple of God's eye. You're so fiercely protected and guarded. I, I was working with Justin the other day, and I blew dust in his eye by accident. We were doing some drilling. And I blew through this hole, and he was the other side. And I, I, I covered his, the apple of his eye with dust. And he's walking around the room, like, crying. And I said, stop it. Be a man. No, I didn't. <laughs> but we are the apple of God's eye so precious to God so precious just know that you're precious take courage you have eternal life do you realize you are unkillable they say aha but we killed them with beasts at Ephesus we killed them we hung them up and torched them under Nero surely we won we burned all the martyrs over the ages we cut the head off that family in Syria Mm. They're unkillable, you fool. You set yourself against God, and you are unkillable. You have eternal life. It's glorious. So God says, get up off your face. Stop worrying, stop fearing, stop whining. Put away your self-pity. Your suffering is a 
according to my will, just for a little while, and then you'll be strengthened. Satan will be crushed under your feet, don't you worry. Since when did your commission change, soldier? Since when did your standing orders go away? Hold the line. Whoever promised you this life of ease, this is war, I am with you. So just wrap this up. I just want you to really reflect on this. The Lord is pleased with us. The work we are doing, you may say, is little. You may say, Lord, how can this even make a dent in the kingdom of darkness? Oh, if you could just see what he's doing. You could see the armies of light encamped around you. You would never ask those questions. The rains are coming, I'll tell you. You keep going. You keep going. Plow. And he'll come and he'll soften the turf. He'll soften that earth. Get through this phase and determine in your heart today that you will not regret that you came through it with no faith. You've done this before. You've come through a challenge and you had no faith and you whined and you answered against God. And afterwards you saw and he humbled you and he said, oh Lord, I'm so sorry. I, I, I should have realized you were there. Let's not do it this time. Let's set ourselves to say, this time, this battle, this dark valley of death, we're going to come through singing this time because we know the end of our faith. Make that choice. Jesus immediately reached out his hand in Matthew 14. And he took hold of him. This is Peter sinking in the waves, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. Peter, Peter, didn't you see? Didn't you realize who it was that bid you come? Come on. Understand what is happening here in this church. Understand what is happening in this city. Understand. Be as the, the men of Issachar who could discern the times and the seasons. See what God is doing. We are priests and kings to our God. We are chosen. We have been rescued from the flames. We have been cleansed and we have been sent by God as a people. His ministering spirits have been sent out to minister to us. You, you, you don't realize there are angels around you. They are ministering to you. They encourage us. I believe they, they soothe our hearts. They work with the Holy Spirit to comfort and, and strengthen. And we are clothed with, clothed with God's righteousness. Zechariah 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Hmm. And the Lord said to Satan, oh, come on. The Lord said to Satan, what did he say? Read it with me. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. Just say that again. The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. That's what the Lord says to Satan as he accuses you. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. That means covered in excrement. That's what it means in the Hebrew. And the angel said to those who were standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. And I said, let, him, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments, and the angel of the Lord was standing by. This is our story. Do you recognize yourself there? And then chapter 4, verse 6, Zechariah goes on. This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel. Not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Who are you, O great mountain? <laughs> Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain, and he shall bring forward the top stone amid shouts of grace, grace to it. He's going to finish this building. Verse 8, then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For whoever has despised the day of small things shall rejoice and shall see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. It's going to be perfectly true, perfectly straight. The work of God is perfect. The work of God is glorious in our midst. Do not fear. Rachel and I have sought to lay a foundation here, and that foundation is none other than Jesus Christ. We have carefully, and we continue to carefully lay that foundation, and you are building on that foundation. Work. Get up off your face. Labor for the Lord, the good works he's predestined for you. And we shall see the capstone laid on this work. 
because the Lord has called us to do a specific work together. And that final capstone is going to be up there. And we cry grace, grace to it. May the grace of the Lord just pour like oil over his work. You shall see it. Who can be against us? God's for us. Be encouraged. He's for us, but he's also with us. And he's also pleased with us. And he also smiles on us. Psalm 32, 7. You are a hiding place for me. You preserve me from trouble. You surround me with shouts of deliverance. Oh, glory to God. Did you know God is shouting over you? He's not just singing. He's singing in a shouting way. And it's over you. And there are shouts and songs that create and produce deliverance in your life. And in this body of believers. God is with us. He is so pleased. Keep going. Keep working. In fact, double down now. Right? In the face of opposition, rise up. Double down and say, we will do double what we were doing by the strength of God. We will pluck more souls from hell. We will go out more lovingly and more diligently to bring these souls in from these streets. Not just homeless people, not just people who've got no money, but what about the dentist who's on his third marriage? He, he tries to keep her happy with Botox. He has no idea what life is. He has no idea that in the next minute he could face eternity. Let's pluck him from hell. Let's pluck his soul. We have the power of the gospel, don't you know? Don't you realize what you have, what you wield in your hand? It's a sword. Sharper than any implement created by men. Speak this gospel. The power of the Spirit will do his work. Because it's not by might or your power. He'll do it. Do not despise what the God of all glory has worked in our midst. Rejoice in it. We're going the right way, brothers and sisters. You know, he says, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with what men despise. And they have all their ideas. And they have all their pragmatism. But at the end of the day, what you need is me to speak. That's what he says. All you need is my word. All you need is my presence. All you need is the love of God burning in your heart like a torch. And it will light the way for so many. And it seems small, and it seems so insignificant. But you know, it's like a mustard seed, really, really tiny. And it can grow into a 12-foot tree. And you say, wow, how did that turn into that? It can shelter the birds. It can give shade to beasts. Isn't it wonderful? You know what else it's like? The work of God. It's like the way he manifested himself in Jesus Christ. Oh, so apparently insignificant. There was no beauty in him that we should desire him. Oh, he was just this plain, rugged carpenter with calluses on his hands. And yet, <laughs> was the great God himself in flesh. Oh, and what did he do? Oh, he then revealed himself in the transfiguration on that mountain. And then he was ascended to the right hand of the Father and took his throne. Oh, this becomes this. Oh, Lord. How is this work being manifested, your kingdom being manifested in this, this clay pot of my life and this clay pot of this church? Oh, what glory there is and what power and glory there is to come. Be encouraged, brothers and sisters. Amen.